Throughout the late 1980s and early 1990s, a Japanese video game development and publishing company named Square had started to gain a significant reputation for being able to consistently produce high quality role playing games. Final Fantasy was the catalyst for this, and following its release in 1987, Square were able to successfully iterate upon it, creating a franchise that gave them a much more stable footing than they had been afforded in previous years. But perhaps realising that they couldn't hang all of their hopes on the success of just one franchise, some of the creative minds who had previously worked on Final Fantasy were tasked by the company's leadership with helping them to diversify. It saw the creation of Makai Toshi Saga and Seiken Densetsu Final Fantasy Gaiden, which both acted as the first iterations in the Saga and Mana franchises respectively. They were huge hits upon their release on the Game Boy, and along with Final Fantasy 3 and 4, helped to solidify Square as a powerhouse when it came to creating role playing games. With three successful franchises now under their belt, and with Square riding on a high after the release of Final Fantasy 6, thoughts then turned to the next evolutionary stage for the company, and much as it had done before, this revolved around diversification. It saw Square assign their brightest minds to a collaborative project that would later become known as Chrono Trigger, and it showed that they were making a concerted effort to bring in fresh ideas from external sources. This initiative as a whole saw a suite of new games created for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Front Mission and Super Mario RPG came about following collaborations with G-Craft and Nintendo. Square North America were allowed to create a Western exclusive title called Secret of Evermore, and they hired Kazushige Najima, who directed a game called Bahamut Lagoon before being absorbed into the world of Final Fantasy as a scriptwriter. But perhaps their most influential hire during this time was that of a visionary director called Yasumi Matsuno. He would go on to create an expansive new universe for Square, the like of which had never been seen before, and it all started with one game that paved the way for everything that would follow. This is the history of Final Fantasy Tactics. Upon its release in 1997, Final Fantasy Tactics was lauded for its rich narrative and detailed gameplay mechanics. Fans and critics alike were impressed at the ease of which the now famed Final Fantasy franchise had been able to transition into the realm of strategy RPG. But it could have ended up being a very different game had the stars not aligned for a visionary director who was already working at Square called Hironobu Sakaguchi. Having overseen the continued rise of Final Fantasy, Sakaguchi was promoted to the position of executive producer following the release of Final Fantasy V. And in this new position, Sakaguchi was afforded more time to think about the future of the franchise. In 1993, when development was well underway on Final Fantasy VI, this was evidenced as he came up with a brand new concept that he called Final Fantasy Tactics. Sakaguchi had envisioned a new experience where Final Fantasy would exist within a more tactical setting, hence the rather literal name, and he created basic design documents to help cement the concept, even asking Square to trademark the name. But with Final Fantasy VI and then Chrono Trigger demanding much of his time, the plans for Final Fantasy Tactics were shelved. That was until Fortune played its part. At around the same time as Sakaguchi had conceived the idea for Final Fantasy Tactics, a director called Yasumi Matsuno was gaining some renown within the realm of video game development, but he would soon come to something of a crossroads within his career. After finding his initial outings into professional work unfulfilling, Matsuno had found his feet at a video game development company called Quest Corporation. It was perfect for Matsuno, as in his youth, he had become interested in how different entertainment mediums could craft rich narratives. At Quest, he was able to start experimenting with this concept himself, having already spent a lot of time writing potential narratives. His initial foray in this regard was a lesser known title called Matendoji, or Conquest of the Crystal Palace, and upon its completion, he was trusted to direct a fresh new experience which would end up being called Ogre Battle, the March of the Black Queen. Matsuno used this game to express his keen interest in crafting rich narratives, and his influences were clear. The game itself was named after two songs written by Queen, who had become synonymous with crafting rich musical narratives, and by acting as Chapter 5 in the overarching Ogre Battle Saga, despite it being the first game released, 
Matsuno paid tribute to the Star Wars saga, which adopted a similar approach. Upon its release, Ogre Battle was well received, with critics praising its sense of scale and successful melding of genres, but for its successor, Tatex Ogre Let Us Cling Together, which would be based around Chapter 7 in the Ogre Battle saga and would also have its name influenced by Queen Song, Matsuno decided to create something that would be vastly different. Hoping to appeal to a wider audience and to also give them the ability to have much more scale, he decided to switch genres moving from real-time strategy to a turn-based grid system. It was a risk given the surprise success of the original game, but Matsuno had a vision that he believed could be accomplished with this new style of gameplay, and after pushing the team, they delivered upon that vision. Yet, as the project was winding down, Matsuno felt he needed to find a new working environment and ended up resigning before Tactics Ogre had even released. Matsuno joined Square not too long after, in a move that made people believe he had been headhunted, but the truth was much simpler. He had seen a job listing, and just wanted to work with one of his idols, Hironobu Sakaguchi. Based on his prior experience, Sakaguchi felt that Matsuno would be the perfect fit to realise his vision for Final Fantasy Tactics, and told him about the project, sharing the aforementioned design documents. Matsuno was thrilled by the prospect, and asked if he could be allowed to develop the game. As he shared with Famitsu in 1997, he approached Sakaguchi with such passion because he had always dreamt of being able to make a strategy RPG within the Final Fantasy setting, and as a fan of the franchise, he'd also dreamt of just being able to play such a game himself. With Sakaguchi impressed, he gave the go-ahead for Matsuno to start working on Final Fantasy Tactics, and Hiroki Ito, who had just finished up working on Final Fantasy VI, was assigned to assist. Together, they started to work on crafting a new experience, yet even though Matsuno revered the previous work of Sakaguchi, and Ito had worked with his mentor for many, many years, they chose to throw away many of the concepts that Sakaguchi had envisioned for Final Fantasy Tactics, instead choosing to follow their own path. It saw Matsuno and Ito co-create a brand new fictional world called Ivalice, which would have a medieval-like feel where magic and machines existed together. They planned for it to feature plenty of distinctive features, but they also wanted to blend in traditional Final Fantasy elements such as chocobos and crystals to create a world the like of which had never been seen before. Ito, despite also confessing that he didn't like strategy or simulation games, decided to use Final Fantasy Tactics as an opportunity to redefine a genre, just as he had done with turn-based RPGs by creating the ATB system. He felt that strategy and simulation games were tedious and annoying, and he wanted to make one that would feel exciting and urgent, something that would be able to complement Matsuno's dramatic and urgent narratives, keeping the player engaged at all times. Due to the very nature of what they were attempting to accomplish, it was decided that Final Fantasy Tactics shouldn't just have a unique narrative and gameplay, it should also have a unique visual and audio style too. And so Matsuno approached some of his former team members at Quest, namely Akihiko Yoshida and Hiroshi Minagawa, who would be put in charge of character design and art direction respectively. He also approached Hitoshi Sakamoto and Masahori Iwata, bringing them to Square to compose the score in place of veteran Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Uematsu. As despite Sakaguchi preferring energetic, exciting and upbeat music, they felt that Sakamoto would be able to deliver something that was much more befitting of the hard, serious world that they were creating. It was a radical approach, but nonetheless the group set about extolling the virtues of their vision for what this tactical Final Fantasy game should be, and with each of them focusing on their areas of expertise, the game started to take shape. Matsuno had a strong focus on character development. He wanted to tell a story that had a serious, gritty realism to it, much as he had done with the stories he'd penned for Ogre Battle and Tactics Ogre. It meant the story for Final Fantasy Tactics would be set within the new, fantastical world of Ivalice, and it would be focused on a conflict that centred around humanity fighting amongst itself. This represented a significant departure from what had been the standard Final Fantasy narrative up to that point, which had almost always seen humanity fighting against monsters or other supernatural beings. To make this narrative feel compelling and fleshed out, Matsuno went on to create more than 80 unique characters. This was considerably more than had ever been seen within a prior Final Fantasy game, and to play along with the theme of humanity, 
they all tied together in a complicated web, as shown here by this character relationship diagram created by a Let's Player called Orange Fluffy Sheep. With so many different characters and relationships, Matsuno created a whiteboard that mapped everything out, and Sakaguchi commented that his work in this regard bordered on that of an obsessive. He noted that after looking at the whiteboard one time, he saw that relationships weren't simply connections like friend or sibling, they were much more detailed, saying things like, these characters have a hard time understanding each other. Sakaguchi realized that Matsuno was creating an incredibly rich and meaningful experience and was impressed that this also permeated into the script writing, with characters showing active prejudice towards one another based on their relationships. Another innovation that Matsuno brought to Final Fantasy was that of the evolving narrative. Within Tactics Ogre, Matsuno had introduced a non-linear branching plotline, and while Final Fantasy Tactics wasn't quite so sophisticated, the story would still see subtle changes depending on your actions. As for example, certain named characters like Mustadio could die within battles, and this would lock out potential scenes later. To help make all of this rather seamless, and to ensure that the tension of the story wasn't lost, Hiroyuki Ito was tasked with building upon the gameplay that Matsuno had used for Tactics Ogre. This saw Ito combine the job system that he had already developed quite heavily in Final Fantasy V with a class system that had been used in Tactics Ogre. But it also saw him attempting to push the turn-based grid system combat much further to create something much more engaging. With the job system, this saw the creation of a job tree, which would see new jobs become available following progression with that particular job or a combination of jobs, as opposed to it being a more linear or plot-based progression. Once learnt, skills could also be used at any time, given the appropriate setup, and it meant that it was possible to create so-called super characters that could learn over 400 different abilities. Ito noted that he made this particular development because it dovetailed well with Matsuno's story, which had a strong focus on people being useful no matter what their class or social standing said about them. Building in with the notion of making the turn-based battle system feel much more alive, Ito modified the system employed in Tactics Ogre to create the charge time battle system. This would see all units and their associated spells and abilities have a charge time, which would denote when they would get their next turn or have their charged commands be actioned. But outside of this gameplay mechanic, which would influence the pacing of the experience, Matsuno and Ito were also keen to make sure that technical aspects worked in with this. One of the struggles they faced was that unlike cartridges, which featured consistently high frame rates, CD-ROMs required a lot more effort to maintain a solid 60 frames per second. They knew that for fans of cartridge-based strategy RPGs, any frame rate drops would be a deal breaker, and so from the get-go, they had it as a mandate that the game would not drop below 60 frames per second. And not just that, they were also adamant that they would not allow the team to use any tricks to fudge things as they didn't just want to give gamers the perception of the game being 60 frames per second, they wanted it to actually be 60 frames per second. To achieve this, compromises had to be made. Battles took place on smaller maps than were seen within Tactics Ogre, and despite using much more powerful hardware, they opted to use a rather muted graphical style. As Ito noted, the main thing for them was to show the strength of a character through their visual appearance, but outside of that, there was no need for them to use fancy graphics, as they preferred to showcase their technological work in other ways. Growing up, Matsuno had developed a fascination with dioramas, often using them to create depictions of war, and one example of this technological showcase was implemented in Tactics, as the player is able to rotate the map 360 degrees like a diorama, allowing them to see the narrative of the battle progressing from multiple angles. Despite being restricted to 16x16 16 16 grids, they were also able to use terrain and height to make maps feel much more expansive and alive. When all of these elements were then combined with the fantastic art direction and character designs from Minigawa and Yoshida, and the music from Sakamoto and Iwata, it helped to create a fresh new experience. What had started off as nothing more than a concept based on a potential game name, had been made into something inherently unique. They had taken elements from the Ogre Battle Saga and previous Final Fantasy games and crafted a game that was unlike anything that had ever been seen before within the RPG genre. Indeed, Matsuno even stated with surprise, just before the game shipped, that he couldn't believe he was allowed to make as many changes as he did, given that Final Fantasy was such an established brand. 
but it tied in with the mindset that Sakaguchi appreciated and respected, and as he himself noted, despite being the producer on the game, he couldn't believe that the vague dreams he had had around the creation of a tactical based Final Fantasy game had been realised in such an awesome way. When the game shipped, these thoughts and feelings were vindicated as critics offered much praise. Famed Japanese publication Famitsu scored it a 34, rating it as the 6th best PlayStation game released that year, and North American publications like Edge, EGM and IGN commended Square for creating such a deep and meaningful story that served as a strong entry into the strategy RPG genre. Indeed, Final Fantasy Tactics has received many commendations over the years, with critics and fans often placing it alongside Final Fantasy VI, VII and X as one of the best Final Fantasy games ever made. Yet even though sales were strong in Japan, with Final Fantasy Tactics selling more in its first week than Tactics Ogre had achieved in its lifetime, overall performance was quite muted. Compared to Final Fantasy VII, which had released earlier that year, Tactics performed poorly, and in Japan it also sold less than every prior release in the franchise aside from Final Fantasy I and II. It's since led the game to being dubbed as a cult classic or hidden gem, but at the time Square were not oblivious to what Matsuno and Ito had accomplished. They had created something special and Square allowed Matsuno to explore his creative vision by building out the narrative of Ivalice, something which he no doubt appreciated, having never had the chance to complete the Ogre Battle saga before he left Quest. Matsuno's work with Final Fantasy Tactics would see him develop a loyal group of fans who would follow his efforts as they enjoyed his storytelling and wider concepts, especially as they often deviated away from the typical Final Fantasy experience. In the years that followed, Matsuno would hone his craft implementing these philosophies across different consoles and generations through the creation, direction and production of games like Vagrant Story, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance and Final Fantasy XII. And despite varying in their premise and scale, each of these games served to show that Matsuno's style was enduring. Yet even with that being true, not everything ended up being as romanticised as Final Fantasy Tactics, and Final Fantasy XII in particular had a rather interesting subplot to its development and eventual release. But that's a story for another time. I think we can all agree that the history of Final Fantasy Tactics is rather fascinating, and I'd like to thank Guideseeker, one of our top tier Patreon supporters, for suggesting that we take a look into the creation of this specific game and really explore how they implemented their different philosophies throughout. Fingers crossed we did this particular topic justice, if feedback is good, then we will definitely look to expand this out into other games within the series because I'm sure there are plenty of interesting stories to tell in this regard. Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments below and if you enjoyed the video and its wider concept, please do hit that like button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell so you get notified immediately when we publish new content. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters and of course a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again very soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.